Welcome to Hot Chips 32. Session 2. Mobile Processors. Good morning and welcome to the Hot Chip session on mobile processors. Today we have two really interesting processors, one from AMD and one from Intel. Uh, I'm Fred Weber, your session chair, and uh, you'll see me at the end of each talk to host some questions. Please do post questions that you have in the appropriate Slack channels, and we'll try to get as many of those in as we can at the end of each talk. So first, I'd like to introduce Sonu Aurora from AMD. She'll be in introducing the AMD Ryzen 4000 processor. Sonu led the a SOC architecture of the Ryzen 4000. Prior to that, she was the architecture co-lead on the Ryzen 2000 APU. She's been working at AMD for the last 12 years uh, on a range of mo notebook and mobile processors and desktop processors. Prior to AMD, Sonu worked on architecture and design of DSP memory subsystems uh, for mobile SOCs at TI. Sonu has filed 12 patents and has 16 years of industry experience. So now I'd like to introduce Sonu, who will present the AMD Ryzen 4000. also known as Renoir. I'm Sonu Arora, AMD Fellow and the SOC Architect for Renoir. Today, I'll share my experience in bringing alive this APU and many engineering innovations that contribute in making this the best notebook processor selling today. Renoir has eight high-performance Zen 2 cores and integrated Vega graphics in seven nanometer technology. It spans market segments from ultra-thin mobile to gaming, to test up. Renoir is the world's first eight core x86 processor for ultra thin notebooks. It was announced earlier in the year and we have a lot of Renoir based products available in the market. We are very glad that we have achieved all and have beaten some of the goals that we set out for Renoir. Renoir architecture discussion started back in 2016. It feels like a long time ago and since then Renoir has evolved multiple times. Renoir's evolution was primarily guided by a desire to break the linear trend of power and performance. We started by thinking that we will bring in six cores, and then as we were analyzing the power frequency curves, it struck to us that with some careful management of SOC power, we should be able to fit eight cores. Also, when we think mobile, it is like having a home in New York. We have limited area as, as it has to fit in the laptop's package cavity. We carefully made room for CPU single thread, multi-thread, graphics performance, and battery life, while maximizing users' return on investment in this product. I'll prefetch Renoir's final scorecard here and then work backward to show you how we achieved this. This is comparing Renoir SOC in 15 watt mobile form factor to its predecessor, Picasso SOC or Ryzen 3000 on CPU and GPU performance and SOC power for battery life. Picasso was a leadership processor of its time and Renoir is taking it further. Renoir delivered eight high performance cores with 25% single thread and 200% multi-thread performance. We significantly improved the performance density of Vega graphics in seven nanometer, delivering 27% overall performance for time spy graphics while increasing the performance density by 225%. We also reduced SOC power by 20% for improved battery life. Each of these metrics was a big challenge by itself, but when put together, it was a puzzle. We had to decide how much to push, push in the direction of single thread frequency would be optimal without compromising power constraint, end thread and graphics performance or battery life. 
there are opposing forces in this puzzle which had to be balanced. We also brought in the upgraded audiovisual experience with our next generation IPs. Before we go deeper, let me walk you through the blueprint of Renoir APU. It is a complete system on chip with CPU, graphics, memory, and IO subsystem. On the top left are Zen 2 cores. Zen 2 supports SMT, and Renoir has a total of eight core 16 threads with eight megabyte L3. Eight Vega seven nanometer graphics compute units are shown on the bottom left. It has two memory options, LP4X and DDR4. On the bottom right, we have second generation of multimedia engine and display engine and third generation of audio engine. Also, there is platform security processor which forms the silicon root of trust and handles boot. System management unit for power management and power delivery control, sensor fusion hub for interfacing with external sensors and the fusion controller hub which interfaces with interfaces such as SPI, I2C or general purpose input output. On the top right, we have PCI, USB, and SATA ports. We added more IOs to keep up with the needs of more modern notebook and desktop platforms. The number of PCI lanes increased from 16 to 20 in the mobile package and 20 to 24 in the desktop package. We also added more USB ports. On the left is the Renoir die flow plan. Renoir is 156 millimeter square die in TSMC 7 nanometer. Two CCXs and Vega 7 nanometer graphics are stacked in the center, surrounded by media accelerators and IOs on the three sides. In this technology, we went with a 13th layer metal stack. As we go down into smaller device geometry, sometimes interconnect can uh, be the limiting factor, but with increased metal layer count, we improve the interconnect performance. We maintain the same body size as previous generation, but pack nearly double the transistor and, and more IOs. Zen 2 processor was optimized for APUs. You may want to see Dan Bouvier's 2019 hot chips presentation for a detailed view of Zen 2. Zen 2 architecture brings in an array of microarchitectural improvements. On the front end, we have an improved branch prediction with Tage, 2x opcode cache to increase the throughput. On the execution units, we have doubled the floating point data width and there is additional address generation unit in the integer pipeline. We've also increased the throughput of our load store unit by 3x. Further, the L1 cache size, I cache size is reduced from 64 KB to 32 KB for maximum perf per area and power efficiency. Overall, Zen2 delivers 15% IPC performance uplift generationally. We optimize the cache hierarchy for the APUs. Renoir has one megabyte L3 per core. We maintain 512 KB of L2 cache per core. So four cores, eight, eight threads with four MB L3 are organized in a core complex. We integrated two of these core complexes into Renoir's monolithic die. When you think about a notebook class product, you can't think like desktop. It has to consider the notebook chassis, the Z height, the power envelope, and the battery life. We have multiple computing priorities to balance. Specifically, when we have, we have to target the silicon just right to get the maximum frequency at the highest end while maintaining the power constraint frequency for multi-thread. Thermal density also has become a key metric for notebooks. For single-thread workloads, power is concentrated in small portion of the die, and we can run out of the, we can easily run out of the thermal headroom before we run out of power or frequency. We have worked through our silicon targeting and design speed up to achieve 10% higher frequency. In combination with 15% IPC, we got 25% higher single thread performance. IPC advantage is achieved by doing more work, such as better branch prediction or deeper caches to query into. More work is associated with increased dynamic power and increased leakage power for the bigger, bigger components doing that extra work. So we needed to improve the power efficiency across the course to not drop frequency and neutralize the higher IPC. We added clock and data gating to reduce dynamic power. We adopted low power design methodology to gate the cores, L3, and the full core complex when not in use. 
Area density and power efficiency achieved by design and technology helped us fit double the cores in the same form factor. So let me share the competitive CPU performance comparison of Renoir across different power levels and form factors. We have compared top of the stack of Renoir versus Intel's 10th gen. Renoir is noticeably ahead in single thread and significantly ahead in multi-thread across the 15 watt low power, 45 watt gaming and 65 watt desktop. We maintained the performance momentum through these different market segments and power levels. This speaks not only to the scalable SOC architecture, but also the perseverance of our engineering teams in delivering this performance. Here is another interesting data point. We have an amazing improvement in gaming experience with a Ryzen 9 4900 HS Asus Zephyrus G14. It is paired with a discrete graphics. In 35 watt, this product delivers 60 FPS and more whether you're playing AAA titles or esports. This speaks to our CPU gaming performance in a 35 watt thin form factor. Moving on to graphics, we have seven nanometer Vega graphics in Red War. We made a counterintuitive decision here by reducing the CU count. As we were analyzing the graphics performance curves, we realized that the faster devices in this technology enabled higher frequency across the frequency voltage curve. Also, when we were designing for APU graphics, we carefully balanced the type of the devices for their frequency versus power trade-off. Seven nanometer efficiency allowed us to push the design further. We knew this is where the seven nanometer technology met the Vega architecture. We continued to have two render backends and one megabyte L2 texture cache. So essentially now, the per CU L2 cache increased by 37%. With Red War, we support 77% higher memory peak bandwidth. But to utilize this bandwidth in a power constraint setup, we need to minimize every picojoules of energy spent per bit transferred. Then only it becomes effective or actual realized bandwidth. We improved the memory bandwidth efficiency by running 2x wide. 8 CU 7 nanometer Vega graphics designed with higher frequency match the system resources perfectly and hence we went for it. We improved per CU performance by 59% as seen by times by benchmark. With Vega 7 nanometer graphics, we achieved breakthrough area efficiency. Graphics area reduced by 67, 61% because of the smaller design and 7 nanometer area density. With overall graphics performance improvement of 27%, the performance per millimeter square density increased by 225%. This is a huge uplift to get in a single generation with an IP and further confirmed our decision. The performance uplift for graphics came from the increased frequency of 75% higher per CU, 225% higher bandwidth per CU, and 7 nanometer density. Next, let us look at the memory controller design. We have two memory controllers on Renoir. Each of these memory controllers can handle single channel by 64 memory or two by 32 using virtual channels. This is another example where we optimized for area and power efficiency by keeping two physical controllers. It can support two by 64 DDR4 or four by 32 LP4X uh, 4266. Let me spend a few minutes talking about the Infinity Fabric. The Infinity Fabric is set up as a modular IP with switches connecting various clients to the memory controller slaves. From the integration standpoint, this has made it easy for us to bring in second core complex. But we did spend a lot of time working our floor plan to fit in these two core complexes and to reduce the memory latency from both these core complexes. Graphics connects to the fabric through two data ports for double bandwidth. We optimize the fabric performance states to efficiently switch to states with lowest latency for CPU performance and maximum bandwidth per watt for graphics workloads. We also improve clock and data gating in the fabric switches to reduce dynamic power. Overall, this helped reduce fabrics power by 75% in Red War when compared to Picasso. This power efficiency improvement helped us take benefit of DDR4-3200 and LP4X4266 bandwidth in the power constraint systems. 
128 bit LP Core X 4 to 66 mega transfers per second delivers 77% higher bandwidth than supported in Picasso's ultra thin notebook. Now, let us look at the graphics com competitive performance comparison of Renoir across 15 watt ultra thin notebook and 65 watt desktop. Renoir is significantly ahead in both. Specifically, when you look at the desktop side, we didn't want our users to have to choose between CPU performance or graphics performance. We wanted Renoir to deliver both, and this is exactly what Renoir does. Now, let us dive into the power improvements. In Renoir, we have three power states in ACPI exposed to the OS. Each of these states can be classified by its depth and transition latency. Deeper states signify lower power, but also signify increase in entry and exit latency to and from that state because there is more context to be saved and restored. We want to enter lowest power state when there is sufficient idleness. Three states allows OS to optimally choose a shallow state in small periods of idleness and deeper state for longer periods of idleness. Also allows us to reduce the hysteresis time to transition in between these states. Here the first state uh, goes to CC1 or halt, where the entry exit is the fastest, whereas the third state allows to go down all the way down into the shut, all the way to shut down the voltage rail of the core complex. To improve battery life, we need to be able to transition to and stay longer in these low power states we just talked about, but also reduce power of these states themselves. Renoir made several improvements for reducing system power and increased battery life. We drove down the VMIN across the SOC, providing V square benefit when operating in low power mode. As we were increasing L3 in this generation, we knew that we had to be aggressive in managing the L3 power through these low power states. We implemented L3 clock and power gating during these states. Uh, IO5s form a significant portion of the overall power in battery life. Low power memory interface, uh, reduced voltage for digital power supply, and power optimized clock circuits are the key contributors to the power reduction. We also made significant improvements in power state transition latency. We increased increase the save and restore bus bandwidth by 2x. We removed the CPU off the stereosis time between, because now OS could actually intelligently select the right ACPI state. We also made several improvements in power management firmware, such as activity timer speed up by 33%, parallelized save and restore of the course, and improved data packing. Here is a generational comparison of power state residency using PCMark 10 AppStart benchmark. AppStart is a workload with periods of idleness in, in between bursts of work. We have made significant improvements in CPU, graphics, and memory low power state residency. For example, the CPU off residency increased from 4.5% in Picasso to 31.2% on Renoir. These improvements together enabled Renoir to consume 59% less power during application execution than Picasso. In order to provide better performance in notebooks, we supported short-term boost by skin temperature aware power management, also known as Tapim. Renoir adds the support for system temperature tracking V2, which can work alongside Stapum. Temperature diodes are placed in chassis hotspots and the temperature information is passed to the SOC. Now the SOC firmware not only knows the temperature information of the IPs internal to the SOC, but also the chassis information to make the right boosting decision. This scheme also works well with DGPUs such as A, A plus A, where AMD smart ship um, can budget the CPU and GPU boost duration and also the power. So in this example, at the cold start, when we launch an application, SOC firmware detects that there is thermal and power headroom and will allow the course to boost. Further, with STT V2 feedback, SOC firmware can comprehend the real-time chassis temperature and allow cores to boost for a longer period. We observe 4x increase in boost duration when thermal feedback from chassis is combined with SOCs. Also, this simplifies OEM's AC design and as now SOC firmware is pulling in the evaluation of chassis thermal state for boosting. 
shifting on to audio visual experience. Renoir has third generation of audio coprocessor, which is capable of simultaneous playback and listening, which is enabled by acoustic eco cancellation or AEC support. It is designed to support popular assistants like Cortana and Alexa. This controller supports up to six integrated PDM mics. We have increased the local storage in ACP IP, which enables longer duration of low power audio playback. We measured 20% power savings in video playback with this feature. Renoir supports native USB-C, the universal cable. USB-C with DP Alt mode supports concurrent USB 3.2, high bandwidth display, and power charging. Renoir supports DP 1.4 with HPR3 and Display Stream Compression or DSC. Display Stream Compression allows for more simultaneous displays to be supported. For example, uh, uh, USB, on USB-C cable using just two lanes, we could support two 4K60 displays and one Full HD60 display when DSC is enabled. We also have our next generation of video codec engine with 31% encoder IPC speed up, which enables 4K encode in power constraint setup. We've also added support for 10-bit HEVC encode. Security is an important aspect of all processor designs. We have added key features in this chip to improve performance with security. Zen 2 core supports GMET, or guest mode execution trap, which speeds up the code integrity checks, preventing code injection type attacks. We have added IOMMU and page translation enhancement for integrated devices such as GPU display and multimedia called ADA or AMD integrated device translation. This reduces graphics reserve memory by 75% and prevents device DMA used by malware while keeping the device performance high. That is giving more memory and performance back to the user while providing improved security. Finally, I want to show you AMD's progress in 25 by 20 energy efficiency initiative. Six years ago, AMD announced an ambitious project, the 25 by 20 initiative. It represented AMD's vision to strengthen the energy efficiency of our mobile processors by 25x by the year 2020. The energy efficiency here is measured as a ratio of compute performance, which is CPU and GPU in 50-50 blend, to typical energy use as measured by Energy Star. During 2018 hot chips, Dan Duvier shared, shared our progress with Raven Ridge SOC. Renoir marks the culmination of this project in 2020. I'm very pleased to share with you all that Renoir has beaten the goal by achieving 31.7x energy efficiency. Compared to our baseline, Renoir reduced the average compute time of a given task by 80% and reduced energy usage for that work by 84%. Together, these metrics allowed Renoir to achieve not just 25 by 20, but 31 by 20. So in conclusion, Renoir achieved competitive power and performance across the different power levels and platforms. Renoir has beaten many of its goals and has achieved an incredible performance density with eight CPU cores, eight CU Vega graphics, and seven nanometer technology. This design culminates the hard work of many engineers at AMD. I would like to thank our AMD design teams across the world, Austin, Bangalore, Boston, Fort Collins, Markham, Hyderabad, Santa Clara, and Shanghai. I'm so proud of what we have achieved with Renoir. I feel humbled to be part of this incredible team. Thank you all for listening. I can take any questions now. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, really interesting talk, Sona. It's, a, it's an impressive CPU and, and really an interesting <laughs> SOC. Uh, you know, I was uh, designing chips back when SOCs started and I think you've really arrived in an SOC when the same chip that has the, the core CPU is also taking temperature sensors from the chassis directly into that same piece of silicon. That's pretty wild. Um, okay, let's try to get a couple of questions in here. Um, so let's start. Mark Hill is asking, 
Uh, what is the status of the me meltdown inspector and maybe other similar attacks on the Ryzen CPUs? Okay, um, I'm having a hard time hearing the answers, but hopefully the, uh, the rest of the audience is hearing them. Um, Fred, is it, is it, are we live right now? Should I go ahead? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay, cool. So um, uh, let me just repeat. So uh, Meltdown does not impact AMD as AMD does not allow speculative accesses across different privilege levels. Um, Zen2 has hardware mitigations for Spectre V2 and V4 with indirect branch prediction barrier, uh, which we call as IBPB, and in indirect branch predictive restrictive, uh, restrictive speculation and speculative sco uh, store bypass disabled. So um, the IBPB ensures that the older indirect branches do not influence the newer branch predictions, and the restrictive speculation just turns off the in indirect uh, uh, branch predictions altogether. Um, and the SSBB disallows speculative loads to bypass stores. So with this, we do have uh, good mitigations in place for Spectre. And um, I, I'll, I'll also like to talk about a few other security enhancements that we have made in this uh, generation. We, we've added a few more enhancements in this uh, generation, which is, you know, we have added support for guest mode execution trap for speeding up code integrity checks. We have also added a lot of uh, improvements uh, to support Microsoft Secure Core PC with virtualization-based security. Uh, we have also improved our IOMMU throughput for supporting graphics and, and display bandwidth. Um, and we have, we have uh, the support for transparent memory encryption uh, on our memory controller. Okay, great, thanks. Um, next is a question from me. Um, so it's amazing that you managed to get uh, eight cores into the envelope of the SOC, but it's still quite a lot of an investment to put that many cores in. Can you say anything about what important real-world applications you might be addressing with that many cores and also the trade-off between that and graphics? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question and something that we really dealt in detail with when we were working through uh, this architecture. So on the core side first, when we were analyzing, we definitely wanted to provide the eight core experience as we were going higher up in the power levels for 45 watt and 65 watt. But as we analyzed the seven nanometer technology, we understood that with some careful handling of the path management and giving more budget to the CPU, we should be able to fit in eight cores. And now the question of how do you utilize those eight cores, there are a lot of uh, content creation types app, you know, photo editing, video editing, or, you know, just um, just doing multitasking, which we all have to do a lot these days, uh, we're working virtually. So um, it, these eight cores really come in handy when you have to deal with all these, uh, you know, high performance capability type applications. Now on the graphic side, when you look, so it, it's a great question when you uh, bring them together, because when we were analyzing the same thing on the graphic side, we were also very careful in understanding, you know, what is our performance per watt and what is our performance per millimeter square efficiency that we can drive out of Vega architecture versus the Navi architecture that, that we had back then. And when we were analyzing this, we figured out that the in the seven nanometer Vega architecture was really uh, uh, going higher on the frequency. And also when we balanced the system resources by providing additional memory throughput, it, it, it really shined ahead. And, and that's why we went for it. And in com composition by you know, having the Vega graphics, it's you running much at a much higher frequency with much higher ba memory bandwidth and these eight cores together enable, I think a much better user experience uh, uh, in, in 15 watt envelope as well. Got it, thank you. So I thought we had a little more time, but it looks like we're actually out of time for questions. So thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you, thank you, Fred. Okay, so now I'm uh, happy to introduce Xavi Vera, uh, principal engineer of Intel. Um, and he's been working on reliability, validation, and performance analysis for 15 years on multiple generations of SOC architectures in both Oregon and Barcelona. Javi holds a 
PhD in computer science and engineering, uh, and is going to be introducing you to the uh, Tiger Lake mobile CPU. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for attending this presentation that will cover the architecture of Tiger Lake, the next mobile client CPU that will be officially launched in the next few weeks. What I would like to go over during this presentation is the different goals that we had when we started designing Tiger Lake, and most importantly, how we achieved all of them. As you can imagine, the top goal was higher performance for the same power budget. We wanted to deliver at least a generational increase in performance for both graphics and CPU across a wide range of TDPs, all the way from 9 bots to 65 bots. This requirement was very challenging for the CPU, since we had to optimize for both multi-core, multi-thread scenarios that are most of the time power constrained, and single-thread scenarios that are usually power unconstrained. But not only that, we also wanted to support high-resolution, high-quality displays, and still deliver the highest possible performance when they are on without compromising quality of service. We wanted to increase the security of Tiger Lake versus previous mobile generations. We wanted to add new AI features for emerging workloads. We wanted to integrate the latest IPs, USB 4, PCIe Gen 4 for the first time on mobile client, Thunderbolt 4. And obviously, we wanted to do all of that at the same power levels with increased power efficiency. The question is, which path we took to deliver in all of them. And we did it by leveraging our strengths and assets. We brought together Intel SOC architects and designers, IP architects, IP designers, key Intel process technologies to re-engineer our process technology and then leverage that to re-architect and redesign the mobile SOC. The net result is higher frequencies for the same voltage level. It's more cash across the board. It's reduced power consumption for IPs that don't need high frequencies, giving more power headroom to those IPs that could use the extra power. It's more features. So <clears throat> this is the outline for the rest of the talk. First, I will introduce you Intel's new super thin process technology that combines new transistor technologies as well as an improved metal stack. Next, I will introduce you the new Tiger Lake XOC block diagram. We will go over the main differences versus Ice Lake, the previous mobile client generation, and explain the main characteristics of the Tiger Lake XOC. Next, we will deep dive into the most critical IPs. We will explain how we design Willow Cough Core to optimize the entire range of the BF Core to deliver high performance across a wide range of TDPs. Later, we will take a quick look to XC Graphics. I would like to take this opportunity to refer you to David Blythe's XC architecture presentation here at Hot Chips, where he will discuss our XC groundbreaking graphics architecture in detail. We will go in some detail over the changes we made on the fabric and the memory. We will explain the new I.O. capabilities and how we handle high resolution displays. Finally, we will cover the new contributions regarding power management. Now, let's move on to the new process technology. We will start taking a look to the transistors. We added a new high-performance transistor that increases drive current with an improved gate process, enabling higher mobility. All of that at a lower C line. We didn't stop there. Besides the high-performance transistors, we also optimized the existing high BT devices used in non-high-frequency IPs, like DEPC and imaging, which allow creating more powered headroom for our high-performance IPs. We were able to speed up the high VT devices while lowering their leakage, which gave us the ability 
to lower their operating voltage. Now, as Morse law continues to shrink feature sizes, the metal stack's interconnect performance is as vital as transistor performance. To deliver a generational increase in performance, we had to re-engineer the metal stack. We improved the resistance and yieldability of the mean layers. We added two additional high-performance layers at the top, and we dramatically enhanced the mean cap capabilities by more than 5x to ensure a rapid and solid power delivery response for high CPU intensity workloads. Now that I have described the new superfin process technology, let me talk about the architecture and how we leverage the new process technology throughout. Let me introduce you the Tiger Lake SOC architecture. This slide shows a high-level diagram of the Tiger Lake CPU die. As you may imagine, different power envelopes may have different number of cores. We show four just for illustration purposes. Different colors highlight the differences versus Islet, the previous mobile client generation. In blue, you can see which IPs are totally new versus Icelic. In yellow, we show significantly upgraded IPs. And in gray, the IPs that remain pretty much unchanged. The first thing you may notice is that we re-architected the SOC to be non-inclusive, which allows us to grow the IP caches as much as we need without compromising performance due to the inclusivity ratio. In Tiger Lake, we took this opportunity and grew the caches for both the core and graphics. Now, I will go over the SOC clockwise. On the top right corner, we see how we upgraded the volume management device, VMD, to have a scalable solution for large storage systems. Intel's VMD ensures smooth additions and removals of non-volatile memory express drives from the PCI Express bus which helps improve uptime and serviceability. Next to it, we see a new IPU, IPU6, that will come in two different flavors depending on product configuration. IPU6 is an evolution of the architecture introduced in IPU4 and enhanced in IPU5. IPU6 has hardware accelerated support for the temporal denoising and support for new sensor technologies such as all types of RGB IR sensors and dual photodiode. This new IPU supports up to six camera sensors, and now it has the full imaging pipeline implemented in hardware, freeing resources on the vector units. Initial product offerings have video capabilities up to 4K30, and still image captures of 27 megapixels. But the hardware is capable of up to 4K90 resolutions and 42 megapixels, respectively. If we continue down the right side of the block diagram, we see that there, are, is, there is a new display engine that supports up to 8K resolutions. We have also integrated the latest USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4 Type-C focusing on optimizing the power consumption during a standby. Next, we can see GNA. GNA is targeted for algorithms like noise cancellation or applications like meeting transcription, translation, and of course, context and conversation tracking. We have significantly upgraded GNA, which now can do up to 38 gobs with one gob per millivolt. These low power capability is increasingly more important in today's modern mobile CPUs, especially with the emphasis on high quality distance-based collaboration. We added PCIe Gen 4 for first time on mobile client with varying number of lanes depending on product configuration. Moving to the left from the bottom, we see a significantly improved power management and fiber that I will cover later on. Now, one area that usually doesn't get much attention is platform debug capabilities. For Tiger Lake, we improve our telemetry aggregator, improve remote debug and triage, 
and improve debuggability when in low power mode. Finally, on the top left corner, we can see how the memory subsystem looks like. Initial Tiger Lake configurations will support DDR4-3200, LPDR4, LPDR4X up to 4267, and is future proof for a later version of Tiger Lake with support for LPDR5 technologies up to 5400. Notice that Tiger Lake LPDR4 configuration can achieve 68 GB per second of peak bandwidth compared to 59 GB per second in Ice Lake, and future Tiger Lake versions will be able to hit 86 GB per second with LPDR5 technology. We also added TME, a total memory encryption engine which applies the XTS-AES encryption decryption algorithm to memory traffic to protect against attacks that remove DIMMs from your system. Let's take a look to the CPU. In designing the CPU for Tiger Lake, called Wheel of Cove, we decided to build upon the foundation of the Sunnycov architecture with all of its deeper, wider, smarter hardware. In order to deliver a generation increase of performance on top of it, we had three different avenues. Increase the IPC of the core, invest in redesigning the critical circuits to take full advantage of superfin, or go somewhere in the middle. Our decision was to focus most efforts in redesigning the critical circuits with a few key, key architectural changes in the cache to make it bigger and non-inclusive. We also added security capabilities. CET is a set of features that helps protect against return jump oriented programming attacks. Willow Cove was designed to optimize the entire range of the BF curve to deliver high performance across a wide range of TDPs. In this slide, we compare the BF cores of Willowkov and Senikov to illustrate this dynamic range of performance. As you can see, at a given voltage, Willowkov delivers a significant frequency increase, which is critical for multi-core warlords that are usually power constrained. It can also operate at any fixed frequency with significantly lower voltage, saving energy. More importantly, the frequency increase happens across the full BF course, a graded dynamic range from B min to B max, which represents a substantial uplift. In the end, we were able to deliver a greater than generational improvement by not only dramatically lowering the voltage at which Willowkov achieved its operating frequencies versus Sanikov, but also we were able to extend the range. After going over the core, it's time to talk about the XC graphics. First, we are leveraging the super thin process enhancements to deliver more power headroom to graphics. With that headroom and architectural improvements, we were able to increase the number of execution units from 64 to 96. But not only that, we could drive them faster, still within the same power envelope. We have also improved the AI capabilities by adding a new instruction, an 8-bit integer for element vector dot product. Let me refer you again to David Blythe's XC architecture presentation for far more details on the architecture. Now, with the greater number of views came a demand for more bandwidth. We achieved that bandwidth through multiple improvements. First, we increase the L3 within the XC graphics. Second, we double the number of connections from XC to the fabric, effectively doubling the bandwidth it can send and receive. But there's more that we needed to change on the Encore side to provide all the required bandwidth. The main driver for changes in the Encore was delivering higher bandwidth. As you all know, there are two ways to provide more bandwidth. Increasing the available peak bandwidth or making better use of what we have. 
Tiger Lake opted to work on both by increasing the efficiency of our systems and also increasing the absolute max bandwidth. On the fabric side, we started by adding a dual ring architecture to deliver over 2x the bandwidth when compared to Ice Lake. We also increased the efficiency of the ring by increasing the last level cut size by 50% and make it non-inclusive, which allows capturing larger working sets. And all this while maintaining low cache latency. We also added the possibility of IO traffic to cache directly. Now, instead of having different IPs communicating through shared buffers in memory, they can use the last level cache, effectively reducing the use of memory bandwidth and creating more bandwidth and power headroom for other usages. On the memory side, we have already discussed how Tiger Lake added higher peak bandwidth. But not only that, we also increased the efficiency of our memory controllers by changing their architecture. Tiger Lake offers two memory controllers that are narrower and deeper, effectively doubling the number of schedulers. That really helps in improving the efficiency for high bandwidth multi-stream scenarios. On the display side, the goal was to increase both number of displays supported as well as higher resolutions and quality for future displays. This poses a great challenge on the quality of service due to the high bandwidth required by these display configurations. Although display resolution support that are highly dependent on the memory configurations, we wanted to be bulletproof on the SOC side. We solved that issue by adding a dedicated fabric path to memory by passing all the arbitration layers of the SOC fabric. The display ISOC port, DIP, supports up to 64 gigabytes per second of ISOC traffic depending on product implementation. In terms of external connectivity, display port and HDMI protocols are used to connect to external displays. Display port can be used as an alternate mode on a Type-C port. Both display port and HDMI can be used as dedicated display port HDMI port in fixed display port HDMI mode. In order to increase responsiveness, we added PCIe Gen4 lanes that enable direct SSD attached to the CPU without having to go through the PCH. Not only this is great for high speed storage devices, for which, which we are seeing around 100 nanoseconds less latency versus connecting them via PCH, but it also allows for other interesting configurations. Say for example, being able to attach graphics cards to it. Notice that the total number of PCIe Gen4 lanes will depend on core count configuration and power levels. Tiger Lake also introduces fully integrated Thunderbolt 4 and USB 4 that are fully specification compliant. The integrated display via the Type-C subsystem builds on the prior display port tunneling over Thunderbolt. More importantly, it adds DPE imports for discrete card display port outputs to be maxed over the integrated Type-C ports depending on the SKU configuration. In order to achieve our aggressive performance goals at the target power levels, we also work on two separate streams of power management work. First, we've targeted several areas of the design for reduced power consumption even with all of the added features and performance. Our improved HBT transistors are vital for improving power in our Type-C, PCIe, and DDR-IO subsystems. We lowered the fixed rail voltages over Ice Lake where possible, while also improving the efficiency of our fully integrated voltage regulators. We also reduced the amount of logic needed to live on our deep slip C-state sustained rail. One of the features I'm more excited about is the new DBFS capabilities. On one hand, Tiger Lake is the first Intel's client CPU to add DBFS on the fabric. On the other hand, we had the chance to update the DBFS algorithms to dynamically match the frequency of the core, graphics, fabric, and memory, independently to workloads requirements.
Let me walk you through one example on how DBFS would work now that all clocks can run independently. At this point in time, the core workload is in a core-centric phase where most data can be consumed directly from the core caches. There is very little activity on the Encore side, both fabric and memory. Therefore, the core runs as fast as possible, whereas the fabric and the memory lower their frequency just high enough to be able to service the very few requests they get. What happens when Core has to start accessing data from the last level cache? In that case, the Core reduces its frequency to match the required throughput of the application, which is usually lower when data comes from the Encore. The fabric rises the frequency to match the required last level cache bandwidth, and memory stays at a low frequency point enough to service the few requests that end up going to memory. Later on, the application starts fetching data from memory. At that stage, memory takes the frequency up to deliver max bandwidth. The fabric reduces the frequency to just match the memory bandwidth. And core also reduces the frequency since there is very little activity there waiting for data to come back from memory. Finally, workload re-enters a phase where there are very few requests to the Encore. As you can see, core frequency goes all the way up, while fabric and memory frequencies go back down to a low voltage frequency point, saving energy. Tiger Lake started its journey with an ambitious set of specific goals. Today, I'm thrilled to announce that we deliver on those ambitions. Tiger Lake leverages the super thin process technology and combined with significant architecture advances provides more than a generational increase in CPU performance, massive improvements in graphics power efficiency in the XC graphics IP by adding more use and running them faster, increased memory and fabric efficiency to support high bandwidth. We didn't only increase the supported peak bandwidth, but we actually made better use of it, resulting in higher average utilization. Reach I.O. capabilities, new DBFS capabilities, and much, much more. Thank you very much for your time. Back to the session chair. Make sure that the light doesn't go off. All right, John. Thank you very much for that, uh, that fine talk. Um, so this, uh, this, session, this uh, question and answer period is the only thing standing between you and what I'm sure is going to be a lovely lunch being served uh, in your kitchen. So enjoy that. <laughs> and then we'll see you after for the, the keynote. Um, so a few questions. Um, I was going to ask you how, how uh, you feel about having only four CPU cores, but uh, you made that a little harder since you left it fairly unclear how many CPU cores there are going to be in the actual products. Um, can you tell us any more about the range of number of CPU cores you're going to support in these relatively low power envelopes? Yeah, thanks, Fred. Uh, as we said during the presentation, the number of uh, CPU cores uh, will depend on the pro will depend on the SKU configuration, and that will be announced during the product launch in early September. All right, so 16 cores at two watts is I should be on the lookout for? <laughs> oh, I'm not ready to comment on that. <laughs> All right. Um, Jim Kelly asked, um, what, what is the additional latency when the memory encryption is, is being used? Yeah, I mean, we are not going to disclose any numbers regarding the latency of our architectures. I'm sorry about that. OK. Uh, can you say anything about the performance uh, impact of having uh, memory encryption in uh, you're going to, I will defer you to the product launch for all these informations. OK. I'm going to ask one more question about the memory encryption, even though I'll probably get nothing there. Um, is there any bandwidth implication of having memory encryption enabled? No, no, there is no bandwidth implication. There we go. I got an answer. Um, Ian Cutris asks, um, what is the PL2 power uh, spec for this SOC? I will defer that to Matt, our design expert. 
Well, I have the same answer that uh, unfortunately uh, Javi already gave, which is that the um, the hard performance specs, whether it's performance or power envelopes, will all be part of the uh, September 2nd uh, announcement. Fair enough. I Today we're just talking about the architectural details of our product. Okay. Um, the Nishan Chandawala asked us, is incoming PCI traffic um, also cached in the LLC? This is uh, part of the IO caching capabilities. So okay, so as a customer you have, or as a user, you have the option of caching if you're interested. That would be that, yep. Okay. And um, what's what sort of uh, frequency is the sampling at which the DVS, DVFS states can be changed? Uh, you know, just roughly uh, what kind of time frames are we talking about? Matt, would you like to take that? Sure, I, I can't give hard numbers, but we do have um, uh, Met, uh, we have we do uh, I'm sorry we, we do sample the uh, utilization of many uh, many interconnects on our device and we can enter low power state based on utilization at a very fine granularity um, so like once based. a minute so once an hour uh, way more often than that it's <laughs> hardware based there's no software in the loop and we do that specifically to to optimize the power utilization of our of our complete system okay all right let's see um I'll try to get one more in here. You're not gonna. You're probably not gonna tell me anything about the latency of the L2, whether it's changed when you uh, increased its size. Is that true? Can't talk about the latency, but I did notice there were a number of questions about the uh, caching hierarchy, and we can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, so, so as Javi mentioned in his presentation, one of the main changes we made was to make the MLC, which is the the, the private cache that each core has, we expanded that to 1.25 uh, megabytes. Um, and as part of doing that, uh, previous uh, client uh, products at Intel have always used an inclusive cache hierarchy, which means the last level cache, that the shared cache that uh, that each core shares, uh, must contain duplicate copies of the data in the private cache. Well, once you grow that private cache to 1.25 megabytes, then uh, between the four cores in, in, in um, uh, the base SKU, we have five megabytes of, of cache in each core, which would take a substantial fraction of that shared LLC. Uh, so that's why we moved to a non-inclusive cache hierarchy where the LLC contains data that is not present in any core and vice versa. And I think there also was another question about the L3 cache, which is the, the private cache inside the XE graphics device. Um, that also is coherent with the LLC uh, as it has been in past products uh, and also is non-inclusive now in Tiger Lake because if you add uh, the 3.5 megabytes of that to the five megabytes worth of private core caches, that's uh, more than half of, of our last level cache. So uh, that motivated the, some of the design decisions that led to moving to non-inclusive cache um, to support the bandwidth needs of Tiger Lake. Got it. So yeah, so those clearly were necessary changes, but they, they also clearly make a big difference. All right, and I'm afraid we are out of time for questions. Thank you very much, both to Intel and AMD, uh, for those presentations, and we'll see you after lunch. Thanks.